So these are some of the popular classic Bluetooth profiles. I could list every single one of them, uh, but the font size would be about four points and you wouldn't be able to read any of them because we've got loads and loads of profiles just for classic Bluetooth. Probably the most popular one today is something called hands-free profile. This is the profile that allows us to do audio from the phone to your car or to a Bluetooth headset or to a speaker and have a conversation with somebody else on the other end of that phone call. And this is required in some locations. For example, pretty much the whole of Europe, uh, a lot of uh, places in the United States, uh, I believe China, Japan, Korea, they've all banned driving and holding a cell phone. Can't do that. And you see people driving along going like this, trying to hide the cell phone from the police, but you know, it, it's just dangerous, don't do it. Hands-free profile allows Bluetooth to be the USB peripheral for audio. It's, it's the cable that you plug between your phone and a speaker. Another one that I use all the time is the Advanced Audio Distribution Profile, otherwise known as A2DP. So this allows very, very high quality music to be distributed from what is known as a source device, like my cell phone or my computer, and a sync device, like the Bluetooth speakers that I brought with me. My Bluetooth speakers are really, really small and dinky. They got great sound and I can listen to music, or I can listen to the radio or podcasts, and I can fill the room, the hotel room, with sound, and I don't need any cables. So it's absolutely fantastic. Another one that I use all the time is something called a human interface device. Now, a human interface device is the interface between a human and a device. It's, it's a little bit like host controller interface. It, it sort of says what it does. Another way of talking about this is, these are mice and keyboards and games controllers and joysticks and things like that. So they're the things that you type on. Uh, my laptop the other week, the keyboard stopped working. So I just got out a Bluetooth keyboard and put the Bluetooth keyboard on top of the normal keyboard of my laptop. Worked great. It's actually much, much more fun on a plane. Uh, you know the, uh, the trays that fold down at the front of uh, cabins? You can put your laptop on there and you put your keyboard on your lap and you can just type away and type away and type away. That's how I did most of my book. Anyway, going on. Uh, another one is the health device profile. We heard a lot about health devices uh, this morning. But there's a health device profile that wraps a standard called the IEEE 11073 that is a standard for healthcare. And then there's a whole suite of application profiles for doing access to data in a cell phone from another device. So for example, the message access profile, the phone book access profile, the SIM access profile. These are all profiles that I use, for example, in a car to get access to my phone book. So when I'm driving down a French autobahn at probably rather too high a speed, my phone rings, my phone's in my pocket, I'm not gonna reach in and get my phone out of my pocket. But the car actually displayed who was calling me. And I could there, therefore choose, you know, it's the wife, or I can call her back later, or it's my boss, or I better answer the call and say I can't talk to him at this moment. So all of those are the classic Bluetooth profiles. And th there are plenty more of these out there. If you want to get access to them, the URL is at the bottom there. It's bluetooth.org slash technical slash specification slash adopted.htm. So all of these are freely available to anybody on the planet. In terms of the low energy stack, uh, this again is the similar diagram except for we've changed a few of the labels. So instead of the baseband of the link manager, we now have the link layer. And instead of things like RFCOM, we've now got attribute protocol and attribute profile. So for low energy, the first thing we need to consider is how do we do device discovery? So device discovery is different depending on the technology. So for BREDR, we use paging and page scanning. So we send out these ID packets, as I explained in the last uh, talk, and then the other device scans for these and therefore responds to them. With AMP, we don't do anything. 802.11 is not particularly good at finding other 802.11 devices. 
Uh, it's normally very slow and you normally have to have an access point. And if you haven't got an access point, it doesn't particularly work very well. So we do all of that discovery via BREDR. With LE, we use the advertising channels and then we send what is known as a connection request to the peer device. Once we've got a connection, then we can do something called service discovery. Again, this is something that is pretty unique to Bluetooth in that we've wrapped service discovery up in the core protocols. So in BREDR, we use something called the service discovery protocol, which unsurprisingly does service discovery. And the service discovery protocol allows us to enumerate what that device does. You know, does it do HFP? Does it do ATDP? Does it do HID, et cetera, et cetera. In the LE world, we use GAT, which is effectively built on top of the attribute protocol to do service discovery. The commonality here between all of these is that we have this client server architecture. So on BREDR and service discovery protocol and in GAT, we use what are known as universally unique identifiers, UUIDs. And these are a common set of UUIDs throughout the whole of Bluetooth that allows a server and a peripheral to expose what they do. So the server exposes a database of services and various attributes or characteristics, and then those characteristics and attributes are identified by UUIDs. UUIDs are typically 128 bits in length. That's what the RFC spec defines a UUID to be. However, what the Bluetooth SIG has done is it's also said if a number of bits are this value, then 16 bits are a SIG standardized UUID. So we only need to send those 16 bits that are different and all the other bits are assumed to be the same. So those 16-bit uh, SIG standard UUIDs are fairly precious, but also really valuable. So let's take something like, say, hands-free profile. So as I said before, this profile provides a full duplex connection between a mobile phone and, for example, a headset that you have on your ear, a headset that you sit in called a car. You know, okay, the car industry calls them cars, we call them headsets because quite frankly, they're, they're something that goes around the head. Um, or it could be a personal music box, you know, portable speakers, or something like that. And there's two basic components here. The first component is something called control. So in hands-free profile, we use the serial port protocol, or RFCOM, to map standard GSM or 3GPP audio control commands and responses. So when you want to dial a number, you use ATD. You send ATD with the number, and hey presto, it starts dialing that number. Very, very common set of AT commands, which is, are the same AT commands that are used in GSM. And then we have audio. So the audio channel is separate from the control channel, and that is using two different types of codecs. So there's one codec that uses something called CVSD, which is a continuously variable waveform, basically. And that is sampled at 64 kilobits per second, and it's sent across the audio link 64 kilobits per second over the um, synchronous connection-oriented channel. And we also have something called wideband speech. So this uses something called a modified subband coding uh, codec, or MSPC, which is the same codec that is the standard codec for A2DP. So reasonably high quality, but it's modified to be able to fit inside an ESCO packet. And again, it's a 64 kilobits per second audio link, but it's twice the audio bandwidth, because we're doing a lot more compression. Now the difference between these two is very simple. With CVSD, CVSD can tolerate a few bit errors. So you don't need to have any forward error correction, you don't need to have any CRCs, you don't need to do anything fancy like packet loss concealment or anything like that. With modified subband coding, every single bit counts. And therefore, we use retransmissions in ESCO, we use CRCs in ESCO, we try to get as much data as possible across to um, cope with uh, bit errors. But if the bits are still corrupt, 
then we have to use something called packet loss concealment to make it appear to the user that there hasn't been a loss of audio. The alternate Mac Fi or Bluetooth high speed, what we had to do there was pretty much nothing. What we did do though, is we improved something called the Generic Object Exchange Profile, or GOEP. GOEP is the fundamental profile that all the other OBEX-based profiles like Phonebook Access, Message Access Profile, uh, et cetera, et cetera, uh, Basic Printing Profile, Basic Imaging Profile, all use to transfer data from one device to another. So it's used to transfer any kind of data. And it's built on top of L2CAP, so it allows a seamless transition between classic Bluetooth operation and well as operation over an 802.11 Mac. In GoApp 1.0, GoApp used a serial port profile. So effectively, we had something which was packet-based, sending data over a serial connection, and then sent that over a packet-based radio. Now, when we got to the highest speeds that 802.11 provides, you know, 11, 53, 104 megabits per second, that isn't a tenable architecture. So GoApp 2.0 bypassed RFCOM in the serial port protocol and goes directly through L2CAP. And this allows us to get much, much higher data rates. So you can do a whole phone book download, for example, in a couple of seconds because there's such a low overhead. It also means that there's less overhead put in a, in a packet. So there's no RFCOM headers. Uh, you can interlace the L2CAP packets that GoEP 2.0 uses with other packets so that the control channel for hands free profile isn't being stalled by this huge object transfer. And therefore, not only do we get better performance, but we get less battery usage. It, it seems quite weird, you know, turning on a radio that uses 10 times the power, but we can send the data 50 times quicker and therefore we use less power. It's, it's quite counterintuitive until you really think about it. In terms of low energy, as you can see, there's an awful lot of profiles on here. So there's alert notification, proximity, uh, time. So you can find out the time of, uh, that the other device has. Emergency, network availability, you know, very, very simple profile like network availability. All it is is effectively one bit to say, have I got a GSM network or not? Or have I got a cellular network or not? That's all it does. But that allows you to drive a bit on a watch display that says, yes, you're able to use your phone here or not. Which would be absolutely fantastic when I take the train into London and I'm going through the big tunnels before I get into the center of London because there's no cell phone coverage, because the tunnels are really deep and really long. It's really annoying as well. One day they'll fix that, I'm sure. Uh, there's a personal user interface profile, there's a simple remote control, uh, all sorts of things that are out there. And again, uh, if you go to technical specifications adopted, uh, .htm in bluetooth.org, then you can see all of these adopted profiles. <laughs>